uh, and then we can see what everybody's being say, what everybody's saying. So today we've got Digby Salby this morning, and he's already had an introduction to the festival today because he was Matt and Aidan's guest on the morning show uh, at eight o'clock, where he gave a, a very, very brief um, overview of what he's going to be talking about today. Uh, and he, he mentioned those robots. Um, how are robots going to be growing wheat in our fields in Dorset? And why? And what's his connection? And who does he work for? And all that stuff. So, um, Digby, uh, over to you. Tell us, tell us the answers. Um, if you want to ask questions, uh, pop them in the chat and we'll there'll be a, a question session, question and answer session at the end. Uh, but until then, um, stay on mute and um, and we'll let Digby do his stuff. Over to you, Digby. Great. Thank you very much, Penny. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me at Festival of the Future. It's very good to speak to Matt and Aidan this morning. It's good to see such um, positive people around. Um, and like um, you say, Penny, I'm going to be talking about um, Agritech in Dorset um, and the 5G rural, rural Dorset tri trials, um, which um, are being run by a consortium of partners um, in Dorset. Um, I'm going to start firstly with a uh, little bit about, if I can move this slide on, there we go. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background to everything really. So who I am, who I work for um, and what 5G Rural Dorset is. So I'm Digby and I joined uh, Wessex Internet um, in April this year. Wessex Internet is a, a family business um, and was set up out of a family farm. Um, so it, um, essentially, they were fed up of not being able to get good enough connectivity. Um, and so the family decided to set up their own um, internet company. Um, and they specialise in providing internet to rural areas um, across Dorset and also into some uh, neighbouring counties. And um, they started off as a wireless company, so providing uh, wireless broadband to people, but now have um, started doing fibre to the property. So that's uh, planting fibre into the ground. Um, and the unique thing about Wessex Internet is that it has always worked very, very closely with farmers um, and landowners to be able to spread the network. Um, and we work very much on a consensus basis by building relationships with the farmers and communities um, and then providing services to the people who um, enable us to reach other people across the county. So it's a real sort of community led effort um, in providing Internet to people. And so this made us perfect partners for the 5G Rural Dorset Trials. Um, and the 5G Rural Dorset Trials are DCMS funded um, trials looking into how we can best provide 5G to rural areas. In, Dors in the UK um, and Dorset is a, is a test bed for that. So some of the other partners we're working with include uh, Dorset Council who are the lead partner um, and are very proactive in, in uh, the digital side of things as we can see over these three, three festival days. We also have the Satellite Applications Catapult which is a big UK uh, tech and innovation uh, institute um, as well as a load of other organisations with specialisms in 5G um, and, and other technologies around. Um, and like I say, so Wessex Internet is perfectly placed uh, for the 5G Rural Dorset project because we have this um, close connection with farmers and also um, because of our, because we're an infrastructure provider. Um, and really, uh, to be clear, it's the fibre infrastructure which is able to enable 5G um, in rural areas. And so the 5G Rural Dorset project, um, like I say, is a project looking at how we best deliver 5G in rural areas. And it's split into four main activity areas, um, looking at coastal safety, looking at uh, commercial connectivity in rural areas, um, looking at an innovation makerspace, um, and then also looking at agriculture and aquaculture. And that's the um, work package I'm going to talk about today. And that's the one Wessex Internet is leading on. So firstly, I thought I'd give a bit of information about um, the scene of agriculture at the moment. So I've spent a lot of the last few months um, with our partners uh, talking to farmers and talking to lots of industry players um, to understand the environment and, and see what the future holds. 
And currently the situation is not all horrendous. Um, 4G is providing um, a lot of benefit to farmers. Um, so we see in this top left picture, we've got a, uh, a 4G modem um, on, on top of a tractor, which essentially connects the tractor to a 4G network. Um, and this means that the data collected on the tractor is being able to sent via a 4G network to the internet and back to the farmer. Um, and this has been led by some of the big manufacturers and, and is quite coming quite commonplace in, in farming. Um, the two issues are the limitations with 4G, so not being able to send enough data, and then also the connectivity, so not having 4G there in all the areas. Uh, LoRa, which is this sort of uh, signal you see at the bottom, this is a, a private um, organisation which provides private networks um, to, to, uh, to whoever, um, essentially, and it can connect lots of different devices um, using a 4G or a fibre connection itself. Um, to each other. So these are mainly sensors in the field. So if you've got a temperature sensor, for example, or a soil sensor, it's able to collect that data and send it back. Um, but again, these systems are quite expensive um, and, and take a lot of fiddling around to install the system. Um, and 5G, we're really trying to explore how we can make that better and also um, combat the difficulties there are in 4G. Two of the main pain points in farming at the moment, um, which um, we've he heard a lot of in during the trials. Uh, one is incompatible devices. So farmers spend a lot of time, very frustrated, um, not being able to transfer information between devices um, and spending a lot of time processing information uh, to be able to make them compatible between devices. So when I say devices, I mean, that is a, a, uh, a field map being able to talk to a tractor, um, a field map taken from a satellite being able to talk to a tractor about where to plant a seed or uh, where to drive, for example. Um, and then another issue is at the moment that a lot of the agri-tech solutions which have been provided, so your drones, your robots, um, they're starting to go into farming, but it's been very, very slow. Um, and the big issue is that a lot of these um, devices aren't built with connectivity in mind because they go based on the assumption that there is not connectivity. Um, and so, for example, at the moment, drones, um, you'll go, a farm will go and fly a drone um, and then take the information off the drone and plug it into the computer. Um, and really with 5G, we're trying to automate this process so the farmer doesn't have to spend his time doing that. As well. So I'll next go on to 5G, um, if I can. Hopefully it will go. There we go. OK, so um, a bit of background about 5G and what 5G is. So. Uh, I'm not sure exactly who I'm talking to, so some of you might have much better knowledge than I do, as I'm not a technical person. Um, however, 5G is uh, a form of wireless technology, and it's an, sort of a range of new technologies that have come together to provide wireless connectivity, um, to be able to connect devices, essentially, to the internet. Um, so to connect the mast to the internet, there's usually the fiber optic cable, and that's provided, for example, by Wessex Internet. Um, and then we're looking to explore how 5G can 5G equipment can be added to the mast and also in, in the background uh, to be able to connect devices more effectively and more efficiently. Now, data is transferred wirelessly using radio waves. Um, radio waves can vary in length um, and Generally, when we say low frequency radio waves, um, these are waves which can not tra transport as much data, but can transport the data a lot further. Um, and when we talk about higher frequency, we talk about lots of data being able to, to be transferred, um, but not being able to transfer as far. And the biggest misconception about 5G is that it's just the higher frequency stuff, so that it's just uh, high amounts of data being able to be transported very quickly. That's not really true because 5G is possible in all the different radio, radio wavelengths. Um, it is, is, in, in, is in, in fact a release of a range of radio wavelengths. Um, so you can have low frequency 5G, high frequency 5G and millimeter wave 
as you can see in the diagram at the bottom right. Um, now, the low frequency stuff is useful generally for um, connecting sensors. So whether, like I mentioned before, soil sensors or temperature sensors um, and bringing all that information in just continuously throughout the day um, for a long period of time. And the great thing about 5G is that it's all about um, having this process more efficient and more effective. And so the devices on the 5G side of things can last up to eight to 10 years um, because of how effectively the network is built. The high frequency um, 5G is looking at transporting large amounts of information. So that's uh, large images um, or uh, telematics data from tractors and transporting that directly onto a farm management platform, for example. And then we have the millimeter wave, um, which we're not looking at particularly in the trials um, and is much higher because it only travels maybe a couple of hundred meters. Um, but it's looking at um, collecting large, large amounts of data um, all at once. And so that's a bit on fire. Um, and really in the 5G trials we're running in Dorset, uh, we're looking at uh, two main frequency areas. So the low frequency areas you see on this chart, around 700 megahertz, and also the high, higher frequency um, between 3.4 and 3.8 gigahertz um, for these use cases. And so if I move on, um, looking at 5G for farmers. So as I mentioned, we've spoken to a lot of farmers um, and try to understand the main needs um, when building 5G into the system. Um, and so the two main aims we have in the agriculture and aquaculture workpiece of 5G Rural Dorset is to design a 5G network that works for farmers and to build a 5G ecosystem within um, farming UK. And to do that, we need to address these main issues. Affordability of the system. So a farmer's not going to pay a large amount of money to be able to connect devices. Reliability of the technology. Um, technology needs to last a long time. It needs to not get away in the way of uh, normal activities. Um, and it needs to be easy to use. And interoperable. So all these different agri-technologies which are coming along need to be able to work together. And that's a big issue in the industry at the moment is that um, technologies just don't work together. And so, as I mentioned briefly before, there are two main areas we're looking at in terms of the 5G, the lower frequency and the higher frequency. Now, the benefit of the lower frequency is that you're able to transport data much further. So we might be able to have a Wessex Internet mast here, and that can um, collect data from maybe 10 kilometers radius um, and just continuously collect this data over time um, and these devices can last a long time and they can be low cost. Um, uh, and, and it can be a cheap way to be able to collect lots of environmental data for farmers. And then looking at the higher frequency stuff, this would be an install Wessex Internet or, or anyone would do on a farm. So putting 5G on the farm itself. Um, and this would be for the more higher tech um, solutions. So we're looking at the, the cameras on the drones or the robots or the field cameras. Um, and it's all about transferring information directly onto a system and also automating processes. So stuff is being able to transport much quicker using 5G um, and a lot more data has been able to be transported as well. And so the trials in Dorset, so we have four main trial sites. Uh, one is in the West, is a, is a big dairy farm in the West. And so we'll be looking into some use cases there, which I mentioned in a second. Um, the second um, are charitable farms in the North. Um, and we'll be looking at some of the more advanced use cases up there. We also have Kingston Moorwood College just outside Dorchester, um, which is aiming to be the, the, the centre of agritech in the southwest, essentially. Um, and that's what they're really pushing for um, and are keen to see what 5G can do for them to be able to attract um, both young people into the area, but also um, uh, private investment into the area to be able to test their technologies too. And then we also have an aquaculture um, operation in Portland Port, um, which is which is a super fascinating part of um, farming that I've never been involved in with before, um, but it is growing really quickly and there's a fantastic strong um, aquaculture organisation within the southwest of England and especially Dorset. Um, and so the trials themselves, um, so 
we're still in the planning phases of the trials, so we're still trying to bring together the partners and work out exactly how the trials will run. These are the main ideas that we've come up with so far and the main things that we're wanting to do. And I'll just go through each of them briefly, um, one by one, uh, just to give a little bit more detail on those. So firstly, we have um, a farm digital twin. Uh, now, this is the concept of having a virtualized farm so that you're able to collect lots of information from across the farm and always have it live um, on your device. So if you have your computer in front of you, you're able to see the uh, soil temperature, the carbon sequestration rate, the, um, the biodiversity levels um, across the farm all the time in one place. And this can be really useful for farmers to be able to both capture the data, to see what's going on in the farm at the moment, but also to be able to uh, build a database of historic information to start measuring stuff against each other and also using it potentially as evidence to present to government um, if they're looking at their CO2 emissions or um, their, how beneficial environmental measures are. And so really you can see this as just a a, a, a program on the computer which is able to tell you lots about the environment around the farm all the time. And it's all about giving farmers more information to make decisions. Also on this, um, the ability to uh, build in algorithms which can suggest to the farmer the best time to spray their crop or um, be able to predict when there's going to be a disease or a pest onset. Um, just based on historic data and building that into the system and understanding both the local environment and also wider data sets. So it's a, a fascinating uh, concept um, and you'll hear this digital twin concept um, across many different industries. Live operations info, terribly named, um, apologies for that, um, but the live operations info is all looking about taking information from the tractor um, and getting it live to your, your, your mobile phone so a farmer can see exactly what's going on on the farm all the time. So you can see the yield coming in from the combine, you can see how much fuel was used in this field um, and so on. Then we have instant drain images. So we're working with one of the leading um, drain companies in the UK in agriculture. Um, and at the moment, how they get their data back to the farmer is by flying the drain, taking the drain down, going home, um, taking the information out of the drone, put it into the computer, waiting a few hours because it's such a large amount of data to upload that to the computer and then process it and send it back to the farmer. And really what we want to do in those trials is for that drone to be able to send the information as it's flying directly back to the farmer to make a decision to send directly to the combine or to the, right, where the, combine, to the, the drill or to the sprayer for precision farming purposes. So they're able to uh, make farming more effective, uh, use less chemicals, and be more efficient in terms of seeding. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so automated robotics. So this is the interesting um, trial, and, and we've uh, so we've applied for a trial extension for this, and so we're hoping that we're able to run this trial. Um, but this is working with the leading UK agricultural robotics company, um, looking to see whether we can grow a whole field of wheat. Um, uh, using robotics. So that would be a world for us to do that. Um, and we're looking to see whether the robot can both map the whole field, weed the field and drill the seed um, to, to, to produce a wheat crop. Um, and robotics, it's still early stages. And like I say, they've been built off and without connectivity in mind. Um, and so it's really interesting to see how 5G might be able to make robotics a commercial reality. Um, uh, into the future. And then looking at the dairy side, um, we're working with a couple of camera and uh, cow tag companies um, to see how 5G can enhance their products um, at the farm to be able to improve animal welfare and understanding of animal behavior. So for example, um, if a cow is lame, um, you can try and look amongst your cows and you've got to try and identify it. It's very tricky to do. Um, and there is technology out which can predict uh, or can identify when a cow is lame. But we're looking to see how we can make uh, that more effective using cameras um, and also how it can be more commercially viable by reducing the cost of everything. 
And again, understanding usage is similar to operations info on the other one, all about being able to understand your water usage, um, what the milk temperature is in, in, in the tank at the moment and, and that side of things. Um, and then finally, we have the aquaculture side of, side of things. Um, and there are two main use cases here. One is looking at the water data. Um, so currently, the, the aquaculture operation we're working with, they would deploy a boat every few weeks to go out and, and um, understand information about the water. Um, that's looking at salinity, um, oxygen levels, turbidity of the water. Um, but we're trying to see, uh, and there is technology out there which can sensor water at the moment, but there's nothing that is commercially viable for a farmer to be able to do this. Um, and really, we're looking to see how 5G can make this process efficient. So a farmer can build up a whole historic database um, of water information and then compare this against uh, the impact it has on the stocks. Um, and so in our case, it's a shellfish and seaweed farmer. Um, and we're looking to see what effect, for example, um, turbidity would have on the growth rate of shellfish. Um, and indeed, the farm remote monitoring, this is about using underwater cameras and being able to transfer the information, those images using 5G out in the water um, and to be able to understand uh, seaweed growth rates um, or shellfish growth rates and also uh, biofouling, which is buildup of algae on the, on the, on the stock um, uh, to see, to see, um, to be able to not have to deploy the boat, which of course is inefficient um, and, uh, and, and time consuming and costly. Um, and so that is a run through, and I'm sorry that it's not quite so interactive as I'd like it to be. That's a rough run through of, of the things we're, we're, we're planning on, we're planning on doing and we're, we're in the process of doing at the moment. And so thank you very much. And I'd encourage you to, to reach out to me and, and get in touch. Um, if you have any questions or if there's, uh, anything that you might be interesting for us. Um, or for yourselves, and then also um, do reach out to 5G Rural Dorset uh, project as a whole, which is running things like I say, not only in agriculture, but in, in commercial rural connectivity, um, in coastal safety, and in, in, a, uh, in a maker space, uh, innovation space. So thank you very much. Um, and I will also uh, plug Gary Little Dyke, who is from the 5G Rural Dorset project, and one of my colleagues, um, who will be speaking at 3 p.m. today. Thank you. Digby, um, thank you so much. Uh, as somebody who, who doesn't come from a farming background uh, or for, from a 5G background, there were quite a lot of new words there that I um, had to get to grips with. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it's it, it's all good. Um, uh, uh, fascinating, fascinating. Um, having heard about the project in the early days, it's come so far already. Um, so thank you so much for, for that. Um, now, this is the opportunity where people can, um, having having digested all that information, um, uh, can come forward with any questions. Does anybody uh, have any questions? Would you like to post your questions in the chat bar? Um, uh, I see Pete's made some comments there while, while you're having a think about what you might like to ask. Um, Pete says, uh, love the idea of IoT and farming, so many potential benefits, not just economic growth of the businesses, but the protection of the natural environment too, win-win. Um, uh, and certainly I was thinking that um, if you can make your productive land more productive and more efficient, uh, it then leaves more, more land free for rewilding or other projects that that um, protect, protect biodiversity as well uh, as well as improving the biodiversity on the land that you're managing um intensively yeah I, absolutely i mean it's, it's fat sorry sorry Penny. <laughs> no is, is have i got that right yeah yeah absolutely i think i think you're you're, you're spot on um and indeed he's absolutely true. um it offers a, a massive ability to have an incredible insight into environment reacts to different practices so different farming practices but also different changes in the environment um, and at the moment we have um, measures in labs to try and guess what's going on but we don't really understand and so to have a local um, live reliable piece of information that's feeding in um, it, it's quite incredible what that can do um, both in terms like you say of being able to farm more productively but also farm in a much more environmentally friendly way uh, in terms of reducing CO2 emissions and increasing biodiversity. Thank you. Uh, I see jo has got her hand up. Joe, would you like to unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes, 
Yes, I would. I've got some. Sorry, I've got, got several questions actually. Uh, really good, Digby. Uh, it's so great to see Agritech coming to the fore as part of this and the, and the aquaculture as well. So really, really pleased. Uh, I just wondered if you had had any uh, correspondence with the Hands Free Hector at Harper Adams University, uh, whether you were using their expertise and some of their tests, um, tests that they are running. Um, I just wondered if you had. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic question. And of course, Hands Free Hector, um, it is the sort of the symbol of, of modern farming in the UK. It's, it's sort of the go to place um, for uh, automated farming. Um, and we, the, so the agronomist working on two of the farms um, was um, one of the partners in that project. So we have close contact with the people from that project. Um, but yes, I do need to reach out and speak more to them about what they're doing, because at the moment they're looking to create the hands-free farm. So they've done the hands-free hectare and now they're looking at the hands-free farm. So I think it's fantastic what they're doing there um, and, and definitely relatable to what we're doing here. Yeah, I'll I'll take that subject a bit further with you after after this then. Um, so also, yes, from what we discussed yesterday as well, from the high potential opportunity for agriculture, we definitely need to incorporate a little bit more on this because I, I think that changes everything. Um, it, it's just just changes the the the, the scope of it completely uh, and uh, and I would ask you if you could save this presentation because I think that it would be ideal to give to Southwest Agritech which is all six LEPs all the six LEP area in the Southwest which I chair our next meeting so I'll email you to try and book you for that if you'd be willing to say say exactly this presentation would be absolutely fine uh, and I also have a bit of drone footage as well from Hummingbird which I'm going to share with you afterwards as well which I used at Farnborough a couple of years to show the the cross-tech activity between aerospace agri-tech it was a really good demonstration so I'll share that with you anyway I think that's me finished then Digby thank you so much thank Very you fantastic thank you Jana and yeah I'll send those through um, and indeed Hummingbird are the company that we're working with in the trials so um, really really exciting company to be working with Thank, thank you, Joe. Thank you for that. Um, you've got yourself another booking there. Uh, and just uh, for everybody's information, we are recording this session, so it will be available on YouTube for anybody who does miss it. So um, uh, that, that's another way of catching up. Um, Julie's got a question. Um, Julie, would you like to un, un, unmute yourself and ask your question? Julie, can you hear us? Multitasking. OK, she's coming back to us. I think she's on her way. Sorry, sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. <laughs> OK, I was just wondering, um, regarding the weeding, can you set it up to preferentially take out things that are pernicious weeds and leave things that are more of ecological value? Do you know yet about the weeding to do with the robots? So I think that's a super interesting question um, because Weeds can have benefits as well, um, and especially uh, weeds can interact with crops in a way that's beneficial. Um, and as, as as I'm sure you're aware, it's all about soil health um, and, and capturing carbon into the soil. Um, so in terms of the agritech involved, um, I'd have to defer to our agritech uh, partners on that. So it would be the, the robotics company um, that we're working with in terms of what they're doing now. I'm sorry, that's not more helpful. <laughs> no, that's okay. I understand. Thank you very much. I'll look. I'll look them up. Thanks. Okay. Would it, thank would you. Would it help Julie to leave your email address in the chat bar, and then maybe Digby can go come back to you? Would that be all right, Digby? Yeah, that's fine. I work at the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust over in Fordingbridge. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll definitely get in touch with Julie. It'd be yeah. good to involve. Uh, good to involve you in the trials. Yeah, we would. I think we'd be interested because in, we're local. That would be yeah. quite useful. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Julie. Lovely, lovely. You've joined us today, Julie. Thank you very much for your question. Any further questions for Digby? Or has he given us so much to think about? We haven't quite um, uh, uh, quite been able to process it yet uh, and come back with any questions. No, looks like looks like we're done then. Um, uh, there are some people I can see on this call um, who do have more uh, knowledge about this project. Is, is there anything that you would like to add 
um, people from my team, for example, that you'd like to add uh, or draw out from Digby's presentation? This is your moment. No, looks like everybody's very happy with what you've told them. Uh, <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> um, uh, very happy indeed. Uh, well, that's that's absolutely great. Oh, yeah, Joe's another another um, uh, comment from Joe. Um, GCWT. Do we know who what that Game, is? Game World Life Trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is, yes. yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. Just coming in again. I I always included the wild fish in the HPO and the work that um, the Game Conservancy did at East Stoke because I thought it was important that we demonstrated um, wild fish research as well. So I definitely, I've got some links there, Digby, if you want, um, but um, also sounds as though head office at Fording Bridge have been in touch in any case. Looks like, yes, looks like Julie's in touch with them. So that's really good. Um, uh, people saying a great talk. Thank you. Yes. So any feedback, please do pop in the chat uh, as well now, uh, if you're finding this interesting. Um, do follow up on Garrett's still time to sign up for Gary's talk on the 5G programme more generally, more widely. So Digby was a sort of deep dive into this particular element, but uh, but, but but there's a, an opportunity to find out about it more widely later on. Um, uh, again, do please pop stuff on social media. Uh, we're using the hashtag FutureFest, as you know. So um, please do uh, please do um, uh, tweet about it uh, and tell your friends. Um, uh, and as I say, you'll be able to catch up on the on the session when we upload it to YouTube, probably later today, possibly um, possibly tomorrow. Um, uh, I think all that remains for me to say now is thank you all for attending and a big thank you to Digby for joining us and giving us such a great talk. It was really good. Thank you.